one of the foremost hand surgeons in Europe. Indeed, she's known worldwide. Um, like all great surgeons, she acknowledges her own teachers, and uh, these include the great Raoul Tobiana and Alain Gilbert. She is a past president of the GEM, the French Society for Surgery of the Hand, and is a member of and a guest of several hand societies, including our own in Britain, the Australian, the American, the Colombian, the Greek. Tonight's topic is spasticity, and her work in the surgery for spasticity is pioneering and wide ranging. She currently works in some nine units in this specialty, both adults and children, and she's currently training and, if I may say, inspiring a whole generation of young surgeons in this surgery, including a team in Treviso above Venice, where I myself also travel as her student. She's also seminal in organizing international meetings on spasticity. Some of you will have attended 2017 in Paris, 2019 in Venice, as well as the annual cadaver teaching in Budapest. Personally, I have been honored to have her as a colleague, a dear friend of many decades, and to share a teaching platform on many faculties with her. I'm constantly inspired by her and consider myself her student, not just in this surgery, but also in the gift of communication at which she is a master, as those of you who don't know her will see. Over, you, over to you, Caroline. Thank you. Uh... That's a very gentle uh, introduction. Thank you very much. Although I'm a little worried about you considering yourself as my student because that would make me quite old, but that's all right. Um, so welcome to Paris. Uh, we are now going to uh, talk about spasticity. So Carlos, do I share my screen now? Go ahead. Okay, so we're gonna try that. Uh, this is it. Okay. Yeah, your screen is up now, yeah. Okay. So are we okay now? You, you're good to go. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. So, um, well, uh, thank you to Carlos and, and to uh, uh, the Pulver Taf group and the BSSH for uh, helping this out. And I'm uh, very honored to be here tonight and uh, we spent some time uh, talking about uh, the spastic upper limb. I work at the Institut de la Main, and you can see it's just halfway between the Eiffel Tower and the Arc of Triumph, the ideal place. And uh, actually it's quite nice. So um, start. Uh, we start with a definition and I always come back to an old definition by Lance, uh, which defines it as a motor disorder characterized by an increase of the stretch reflex and it's easier to understand it as an increase of the muscle tone and exaggerated reflexes amounting to a clonus. So we have an increase of the muscle tone. This is what we want to remember. Uh, this is quite a difficult subject and one of the reasons is because uh, it's uh, clinical presentation is uh, very, very, can be very different and it's quite complex. So we're gonna try and go through this. Uh, what causes spasticity? Well, there are several uh, etiologies, several causes of children uh, with cerebral palsy, 85% of them are said to have spasticity. Another cause is head injury and that's mostly young adults. Uh, stroke is mostly uh, older adults and 30% of them are uh, uh, known to have uh, spasticity. And uh, we find also uh, spasticity in a number of cases of tetraplegia, mostly in the lower limbs, but if the tetraplegia is incomplete, it's quite frequent to have uh, spasticity. There are other causes such as uh, multiple sclerosis, et cetera. So uh, we must remember that uh, the cause uh, of spasticity can lie either in the brain cortex or in the spinal cord. Some people tend to forget about that. And this is also known as the upper motor neuron syndrome, which is a little bit difficult to understand for non-English speakings because we don't, we don't always use these words. Anyway, so we're gonna spend part, uh, as the first part of this talk uh, on clinical examination. This is extremely important because if you wanna treat those people right, 
you need to understand uh, what's going on. You need to understand what's wrong. And this is done mostly through clinical examination. So this is not done as a single uh, individual in, uh, in, uh, in the usual setting. We try to gather and uh, examine those uh, patients together. There is uh, the, the medical doctor taking care of them, whether uh, physiatrist, neurologist, pediatrician, uh, physical therapist are an important part of the group. Uh, in France, uh, occupational therapists, and I think you have them also in, uh, in, in the UK, in some countries it's not so separate, but uh, to me, the occupational therapist is a very important part of, uh, of the team because they spend a lot of time with those patients and uh, probably those are the ones who know, <clears throat> who know best, you know, what, is the, the prob what are the problems and how we can help. And of course, the surgeon is only part of the team. And I would certainly not put the surgeon at the head of that team. Uh, when we're doing the examination, we need to be in a specific environment. It needs to be quiet. It needs to be warm. It, uh, this is important because we know that uh, spasticity is likely to increase with a number of circumstances. And emotion is one, fatigue is one, cold temperature, uh, etc. So you really need to have a, a, a quiet environment. You need to have time. You cannot examine a spastic patient in five minutes. This really takes time. And, uh, and provided uh, this is done, I think we can get a lot of information from, um, from the uh, clinical examination. We never embark into surgery after a single examination. Again, spasticity varies. So it is important to see the patient several times in order to have a better idea of uh, what we do. Um, we tend to do a lot of uh, recording of our clinical examination. We try to use standardized charts. This is one. There are many. I think the important is to, uh, to design one that you, that you like. And we do a lot of uh, video recordings. This is especially important in children. Children, you cannot spend half an hour examining a child. So before uh, the, uh, before the um, examination, um, usually the occupation therapist has done videos and we look at the videos together before the child even comes into the room. And through that, we already have a good idea of uh, what to look for and what we are actually going to examine in the child. You see here, the ideal setting is when you have two cameras at right angle, one from each other, and that allows you to see a lot of things. A very nice third camera that my occupational therapist have uh, 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 have uh, designed, or not designed, but have, have done as a third setting, is putting a camera underneath a transparent table and looking at how the, the, the patient, this is a child here, uh, grabs object. And you, you see here how well you can see the thumb. The thumb is always difficult to examine because of the pronation deformity. And here is quite a neat, uh, it's quite a neat thing to do. So we, we use that a lot. So first, what we're going to do is examine the patient at rest. Spontaneous posture gives you a lot of information. The typical picture is in shoulder A deduction and internal rotation, in elbow flexion, in wrist flexion and pronation, and in children, often in honor deviation. Why children in honor deviation? Because of the FCU, of course, but I'm not sure why the FCU should be more spastic in children than in adults. For the fingers, the picture can be very different. In the center, you see this is the typical uh, wrist flexion, finger flexion, deformity, but you see that you have a whole lot of other different uh, types of deformity, swan neck, intrinsic contracture, uh, pseudo-boutonia type of deformity, wrist extension, so everything can be seen. And uh, so this is what we were talking about earlier. You know, spasticity is variable and would lead to uh, very different uh, uh, deformities. 
for the thumb, the typical, um, the typical posture of the thumb is in a deduction and sometimes in flexion a deduction amounting to the thumb in palm deformity. Tonkin has made a nice classification of uh, um, uh, categorizing the intrex intrinsec type, he's called it type one, extrinsec, so this is uh, Flexopolis's longest type, and most often the type three, which is a mixed uh, type. So what we are going to try and find out during our uh, clinical examination is what is the cause of the deformity. And then once we have identified, identified, I'm sorry, each of those causes, we will be able to treat them. So obviously spasticity is the main, or at least the fir first the deforming factor. We all know its uh, main characteristics. It's mostly um, um, involving flexor, adductor, and pronator muscles. It resists stretching, but finally yields. That's important with a return to initial posture. And it is uh, accompanied by hyperreflexivity. Hyper well, there are many problems with, uh, with uh, uh, spasticity, and, and one of them is to uh, evaluate uh, spasticity. The most used uh, scale is known as the Ashworth scale, modified by Bohannon in 1987. But if you look into it, you see uh, no increase, slight increase, slight increase, more marked increase, and you realize very easily that uh, this, uh, uh, this Ashworth scale is not very objective and it's very much uh, evaluator dependent. And you see that Florent in 2010 uh, um, named his article, Stop Using the Ashworth Scale. Uh, another interesting scale is, uh, was designed by a French neurologist, Tardieu, and that, that was many years ago in 1984 except that he didn't uh, speak English, didn't care for English, and it's not uh, uh, until recently that this has been known. And Tardieu scale is uh, based on what we call the angle of catch. And I'm gonna show this to you right now. And you see, oops, I'm sorry, that's a bad move. I'm gonna try and go back. And here we go. And the angle of, of catch is uh, with high velocity, you see, when the catch take place and we measure that angle. And uh, there are also other measurements. Uh, the type of catch is important also. And finally, um, evaluating our patients, we have found that the combination of Ash Ashworth and Tardieu scale is the best way so far, maybe we find better ones later, but so far is the best way to evaluate spasticity. However, there are many things that mimic spasticity and we're not sure how to call them. I've, I've put a certain number of names here, but some other people will call them with other names. There is rigidity, there is hyperviscosity, there is force generated by uh, active muscle fibers. And sometimes it's quite difficult, quite difficult to make sure that we are indeed dealing with spasticity. And dystonia will talk about that in uh, a few minutes. Excuse me, the second uh, cause of deformity is muscle contracture. It's quite easy to understand that uh, a spastic muscle with permanent or very frequent contractions of the muscle will, will end up shortening and some contracture is going to develop. Uh, to the difference of spasticity, it does involve, of course, the same muscles, but it is permanent. It cannot be uh, overcome. Uh, except by shortening the articular segment when you have a B or triarticular uh, type of muscle such as the finger flexors. The problem is that spasticity and contracture, of course, are very often associated, but we need to distinguish them because they, we will see that they have a different treatment. Uh, we have some, we get some help uh, from uh, from uh, some uh, substances and uh, namely nerve blocks and muscle blocks because when we apply these blocks spasticity is going to yield whereas contracture persists. So in, in severe cases of spasticity this is uh, extremely interesting. 
uh, finger contracture now we can uh, evaluate through the uh, well-known angle of Volkmann. So this is a minimum wrist flexion, which is required to obtain full, full extension of the fingers. You see here it's been measured at 75 degrees, so it's a pretty nice evaluation. Uh, now on to the intrinsic muscles. We don't have time to go into details uh, in the contracture, but uh, let's remember about the phenoketos test when the MP joints are in extension, if you cannot flex the PIP joint, there is intrinsic contracture. On the contrary, when the MP joint is in flexion, sorry about that, when the MP joint is in flexion, you can easily flex the, uh, the PIP joint. So remember, when the MP joint is in extension, if you cannot flex the PIP joint, you do have an intrinsic contracture, and this is important in those patients. Joint deformity would be the next cause uh, of, uh, of deformity. It is uh, not very frequent in children, uh, neither uh, is it in, in adults. Uh, the difficulty about joint deformity is that if there is muscle contracture, you will only be able to assess the joint deformity on the operative tables, table, I'm sorry, once you have uh, gotten rid of the muscle contracture. So this is uh, sometimes uh, uh, a per operative surprise. The other type of joint deformity is hyperlaxity. You, we see that mostly in children and mostly at the level of the finger PIP joint and the thumb MP joint. Last but not least, uh, the last cause of the deformity is the uh, muscle imbalance. Imbalance between the spastic muscles, which are usually active, so they are spastic and active, those are mostly the flexors and the pronators, and of course their activities, their strengths, may be quite difficult to assess because of all the surrounding deformities. Look at this young eight years old girl with his flex wrist, well, with the hyperflex wrist, it's very difficult to test finger flexors. On the opposite, the non-spastic muscles, we're talking about the extensors and the supinators, are known to be often paralyzed. And you see here, I've, I've written pseudo-paralyzed because sometimes they're not paralyzed. So they're just prevented to be active because of the antagonist muscles, which are which are so spastic and pulling so hard. So part of our goal is going to find out what is the value of those non-spastic muscles. Are they indeed paralyzed or do they just need releasing the antagonists in order for them to uh, uh, so-called wake up and be active? This is of course very important. So again, difficult to assess. And then we have a number of things we, which, uh, uh, which are associated. And if you look at this hand, it's quite hard to understand why these fingers move differently. Index and little finger different from uh, third and fourth finger. Well, there are apparently several reasons to that. There is paresis of the EDC, which is greater than the paresis of the EDP to second and fifth finger, but mostly, there is probably spasticity of the finger flexors and the inter OCI that uh, account for this. So you see, we, we can spend uh, quite a long time on, on, those, uh, on this clinical examination in order to understand what's going on. And finally, in children, there is one thing that really needs to be taken into account because this will usually be a contraindication to surgery, and that's dystonia. You see this little CP child, she has a left hemiplegia, she's now trying to move, uh, to move her left arm, and you see how difficult it is for her and, and what poor control she has on, on those involuntary muscle contractions. And of course, with this kind of dystonia, surgery is not indicated. You will not get anywhere uh, with, uh, with this type of, uh, of dystonia. Here it's quite obvious, but sometimes it's milder and you need to be careful about dystonia in children. So what other tools do we have that could help us uh, assessing that uh, spasticity 
EMG study, well, EMG studies don't help much. And I must say, I'm not using them very much uh, just to assess uh, the value of, uh, of, of a muscle. Uh, EMG studies will tell you if the muscle is active or not, but it won't give you much quantitative information. On the other hand, uh, it can be very helpful when we uh, intend to do a tendon transfer, and then we will do dynamic EMG studies. We'll come back to that. But the um, thing that is uh, mostly helping us uh, for, for, the di for diagnostic purposes are nerve and or muscle blocks. I use muscle blocks rather than nerve blocks. Uh, it's um, quite easy to use and uh, its action, as you know, lasts several months, at least two or three months. And so during those two or three months, you really have time. You have time for what? Well, you have time to evaluate the contractures, as we said, but you also have time to assess antagonist muscles. As I said earlier, you know, those, uh, those antagonist muscles, those extensors and supinators, which uh, seem paralyzed. Well, once you have uh, put some uh, toxin botulinum, botulinum toxin, I'm sorry, in, in the spastic muscles, then you can start moving them, activating them with the physiotherapist, and then you may have the good uh, surprise of seeing them be active again. You can also um, assess spasticity of other muscles, and this is especially true within intrinsic muscles of the hand. If you have a tight fist because the uh, finger flexors are uh, so spastic, there is no way you can examine the intrinsics until you have paralyzed temporarily your finger flexors. And so this uh, botulinum toxin is going to be extremely helpful in the preoperative planning. And I'm gonna show you an example of that right now. But uh, just before that, I wanted to tell you that it's extremely rare that we nowadays operate any patient uh, without doing a preoperative botulinum toxin. So here's this uh, nice uh, boy, and uh, he's a cerebral palsy left hemiplegia, and he has uh, spasticity in his thumb ad adductor, which is preventing opening of the hand. And so we wanted to test this, uh, this muscle and by applying toxin in it and seeing how, you know, if he performs better. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he put his best T-shirt for the first examination and he put the same best red T-shirt for the second examination. So you're going to have to follow that quite uh, carefully, uh, but I've put some little tags here. So he's performing what's called the AHA test, where the child has to perform a cert certain number of uh, activity activities, I'm sorry, it's playful, and uh, he's not told how to perform them. He's just asked to perform them. So here now we are post-toxin and we go on to the next activity where he has to open this uh, little uh, bag. And you see here before toxin, his hand is used only as a press. He has no kind of grasp and he has found himself now after the toxin that he can use it. And the best example is here, opening the bottle and putting some marbles in the bottom. So in the bottle. So here pre-toxin, pre he cannot you know, perform very well. He doesn't uh, have the capacity to hold the bottle straight. And now after toxin in his thumb adductor, you see things become much more simple and uh, he can perform this task quite, quite easily. So with just the help of this botulinum toxin in one little muscle, we know what to do now. We need to diminish spasticity in his thumb adductor. Uh, after motor examination, of course, we want to examine sensation. Usually basic sensations are intact or pretty good, whereas uh, complex sensations such as proprioception, stereognosis are altered. Uh, if basic sensation is intact, we don't have to, to, to worry too much, but uh, if it's uh, severely altered, then this may amount to a contra contraindication at least to uh, functional surgery. 
functional examination. This is a whole uh, chapter by itself, but we, we will have to go quite fast in that. Uh, let us remember that we want some tests that will uh, tell us about grasp, pinch, and release. Release is a big problem in, in, many of these, uh, in many of these patients. And so we need to see how they perform uh, also in release. And you see, we use different uh, objects of different sizes, shapes, and weight. Uh, by manual activities are very interesting, be interesting because they have uh, to use the, uh, uh, the involved hand, especially in hemiplegics. And I like uh, those uh, Russian dolls, uh, which are quite nice. And they also, there is also some cognitive testing with the Russian dolls, a number of of complex tasks and the time recording to, uh, to achieve the task will help. And uh, also very important for children, ADL questionnaires. Uh, children uh, like to perform in front of the examiners. They like to please us. And so sometimes they're going to use their hands, uh, especially hemiplegics, in a quite nice way. But then uh, if you talk to mom, mom says, oh, but you know, doctor at home, he or she does ne never uses it and uh, always keeps it in the pocket. So you need to understand that and to evaluate that if you don't want to have a bad surprise at the end of the day. So uh, there have been many tests, there have been many skills which have been described. Some are mostly analytic, some are both analytic and functional. And here I've shown you the box and block test, the nine hole peg and so forth. Some are purely functional, uh, like the AHA test I showed you earlier. What, what you need to do is choose one or choose several. Sometimes we need to choose several and stick to them. So this way you're gonna be able to evaluate your patients pre-operatively and compare them to the post-op and compare them uh, between themselves. I like the house classification uh, designed by Jim House in 1981. It's very uh, uh, easy, simple to perform during uh, the clinical uh, examination. And it just gives you a rough idea of how much the patient uses his or her hand. Of course, we have to remember that those spastic patients do have other impairments. And so this must also be evaluated. Lower limb in, in hemiplegic patients, upper functions can be uh, also impaired. Beware of uh, vision defects. That's gonna be a big problem for them. Uh, extra pyramidal, they have epilepsy. Apraxia can be a big problem. Uh, and this is a difficulty with planning uh, a movement. And also the cognitive impairment, although cognitive impairment to me and to many others is not a contraindication even to functional surgery. Other factors are important. Look at this, uh, this young boy. He has this uh, very severe wrist deformity on the left side. We need to operate on them, but look at him. During the whole of the examination, he did not stop moving, spit on people, uh, call people names, and, uh, and, and was all over the place during the whole, uh, the whole session. So you need to take this into account. You need to adapt your surgery. You need to adapt your post-op, uh, even though you have to do something with them. Uh, environment, uh, children, you know, our mom and dad going to be around, take them to, uh, to the physiotherapy and so forth. Uh, motivation, some uh, uh, patients are depressed, especially when you, when you deal with stroke patients and uh, don't care about improvement. On the other hand, some uh, patients have uh, uh, great expectations, and, and we need to beware of teenagers uh, with uh, cerebral palsy. Uh, those kids, uh, you know, usually are, have a good, uh, uh, are well taken care of, of during infancy and, and, and uh, an early age, and then they get tired, they don't see any more improvement, and usually they disappear from our radars. And uh, we see them coming back around uh, 14, 15, 16. And we need to understand why they come back. And usually, usually the, 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 the thing they want, they want a hand or, or a limb that looks normal. They don't care about function anymore. They care about aspect. You know, they have uh, friends, they have girlfriends, and, and they're tired of this uh, arm coming up all the time. And so you need to hear that uh, because you can, you can help them, but you need to hear that they don't want function, they want cosmesis. 
So uh, to, to clo close this first part of, uh, of our talk, remember that clinical evaluation needs to be repeated. It needs to be performed as a team. And, 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 and this way, we will be able to select the proper candidate. And let me have a little bit of water. And so we'll go on with um, surgery. And uh, we will deal with, with the principles of uh, that uh, surgery of, uh, of spasticity. And first, a, a question, what can we do? What can we improve? Well, there are some things like spasticity, muscle contracture, John deformity that, of course, we can impact on. Muscle paralysis, well, maybe if we can find a muscle to transfer to, uh, to, uh, to get rid of the paralysis. But some of the things such as sensory deficit, and that's been said before, dystonia, there is no way surgery itself can have any effect on that. Most important is what is our goal when we're treating these patients? And uh, roughly, the, there, would be, there would be three main goals and, and a fourth one. Of course, we're trying to improve function. Every time this is possible, we will improve function. But on many occasions, function is not the goal. Look at this patient. He's, uh, he has uh, uh, severe, uh, severe cognitive problems. He's bed wound. And all we need, and all the family wants, and, and all the... Uh, the nurses taking care of him want is a better uh, uh, alignment of his uh, upper limbs so they can uh, take better care of him for nursing, hygiene, and decrease the pain. And of course, here we're not dealing with function, but we need to take care of that also. In other patients, and we talked about the teenagers, it's going to be uh, cosmesis that's important. And again, we need to hear what they want and then uh, adapt our surgery to their uh, requirement or to the, to the desires. There is a fourth um, uh, goal, which we must be uh, quite careful about, uh, is prevention of orthopedic deformities. This is important, especially in, uh, in children. And, um, and Carlson uh, in, in 2014 showed very clearly that there was a direct correlation between growing age and the degree of contracture. And if you let uh, a contracture develop uh, after 12 years, you see that they, have five, they are five times more likely to have fixed elbow contracture than under 12 years of age. So in a small child, if you see some contractures start developing, one needs to intervene quite early in order to avoid fixed uh, contracture. If we're talking about functional surgery, what, what is our goal? What is the concept? Well, the concept is to restore the balance. Restore the balance between those spastic muscles, usually the flexors and pronators, which are uh, spastic and, I'm, so, I'm sorry, which have spasticity and muscle contractures, and to reinforce the control of the opponent muscles, the extensors, the supinators, which are either paralyzed or pseudo-paralyzed. So you see right away that we are likely to do multiple procedures. And these multiple procedures, we try to do them all together in one session, at least on one area area on one joint, because it doesn't make sense to reduce uh, spasticity if you don't reinforce the voluntary control, because spasticity and or contracture are likely to, um, uh, to recur. So reduce spasticity, how do we do that? We've talked about nerve blocks, we've talked about botulinum toxin. Is there a way we can do that surgery? Certainly. And this is uh, uh, called partial neurectomy. We all know about complete neurectomy, which is going to uh, make a muscle paralyzed. But here we're talking about partial section of, uh, of, of a nerve. So we're dealing with motor nerves and our goal is going to reduce the spasticity, but with, without suppressing the useful muscle tone. And uh, of course, this uh, type of surgery is indicated only in spastic muscles without muscle contractures, or you need to add other procedures to get rid of the contracture.
Stoffel many years ago had shown that uh, uh, by doing partial nerectomy, uh, you could indeed achieve that, uh, that goal. Uh, a technique has developed mostly uh, through our, our neurosurgeon colleagues, which is a truncular technique. So they approach uh, the motor nerve at the trunk level, as you can see here, and uh, with the help of electrical stimulation, they identify the fascicles for the muscle they want to treat. And uh, once they have identified uh, the, the, the fascicles, they resect part of those fascicles. Uh, the advantages of this technique are a limited approach, as we can see here. The problem is that uh, uh, identification of uh, those muscles and, and the nerve to the muscles relies only on electrical parameters. And we know that sometimes it's not so uh, precise uh, because of the variation of motor branches. And so some of those nerve branches may be missed. And uh, also another uh, really problem is that some sensory branches might end up getting cut. And this leads to some postoperative pain, which is sometimes really bothering. Uh, Brunelli, uh, our uh, Italian colleague, uh, well known, uh, who unfortunately deceased last year, uh, found a better way of uh, dealing with that by uh, approaching the fascicles all the way to their entry into the muscle. And there you cannot go wrong. You identify very precisely which branches uh, go for which muscle, and then you can do a partial resection of those branches. Usually partial resection is two thirds of uh, the motor branches. Sometimes you can do less, but not much less. We, we, uh, it's been shown uh, on many occasions that uh, less is not very effective, but sometimes you can do more if required. So we have pushed uh, these, uh, uh, this uh, technique uh, very much uh, uh, in, in our group and uh, termed it hyperselective nerectomy. You see this, uh, this is a dissection of the musculocutaneous nerve and you see how we follow each of the little branch and each of the rami of, uh, of those branches going into the muscles. And uh, this is where the nerectomy is performed. You can see here in the living, these are the four branches uh, for the FCR with the median nerve on top. And uh, you see that you can, uh, you can dissect that quite nicely, uh, of course, with uh, surgical loops and, and microsurgery instruments. And then you can perform a very nice uh, resection of how much you need to resect. So before embarking on that, we did uh, uh, a, a large number of cadaver dissection and, and, and we performed a, a mapping of uh, each motor branch. This has been uh, published in the literature. And, and so now we have a pretty clear view of, uh, of uh, each uh, motor nerve and, and their branches. There are indeed many variations. So you need, uh, you need to go through that if you want to do this surgery. Uh, however, we do get uh, ex uh, extra help uh, from per-operative stimulation, which uh, we use all the time. And in case of doubt, this, uh, this is going to be uh, very helpful for uh, those surgeries. Uh, very briefly, we are, have just uh, finished uh, uh, a large prospective study of 65 uh, patients, and this is in press. We hope this is, uh, will come out uh, uh, in uh, our favorite journal uh, uh, very soon. Uh, so there were 65 patients, uh, uh, 20 children, 45 adults, with an average follow-up of 30 months. Uh, you see that amounts to a great number of muscles that were uh, nerectomized, 219. I will not go into the details, but mostly uh, elbow flexors. And just, I uh, just want to show you our results summarized on this table. You see, uh, we've uh, looked at pre-operative measurements, measurements at six months post-op, and at last follow-up to see if the results were um, uh, were. Um, I'm sorry, I cannot find my word, but could be trusted in the long term. So you see that the spontaneous, uh, and these are the results only for the elbows. I'm not going to show you the rest. So you see for the spontaneous 
posture, uh, quite nice improvement and that's durable. That's, uh, that's the word I was looking for. Uh, range of motion, range of motion, whether active or pass passive does uh, improve, but moderately it is uh, significant, but it's moderate. We don't gain much motion, whether active or passive uh, with those techniques. Uh, the great uh, news of, of this work, and, and it's, been, uh, it's been said before in the literature, is that there is no loss of flexion. So, uh, so you do cut two thirds of, of the, the, motor, uh, the motor branches to a muscle, a muscle, and in the end, it does not look, uh, lose strength. And, and this was very reassuring. And of course, the antagonists have a tendency to gain strength, but this is not surprising. And now finally, the, the uh, spasticity measurements, uh, you see that all of the spasticity measurements have improved with, however, a slight tendency to relapse at last follow up, but this is, seems to be quite stable in the long term. Function improves to some extent, and satisfaction of the patients is quite high. So, this hyperselective uh, uh, technique is indeed effective on spasticity. Uh, I would say that it displaces range of motion. Uh, rather than really uh, bringing great uh, improvement in active motion, no loss of strength, improvement of the strengths of the antagonist, slight relapse of the spasticity at long term, and high level of patient satisfaction. This is a result of uh, this technique. And uh, this young uh, boy had uh, uh, hyperselective neurectomy of uh, the musculocutaneous nerve and uh, the median and on the nerves at, uh, for the wrist. And you see, uh, with the, this is a boy with only spasticity, no contracture, and we can end up with satisfactory results. Next, um, uh, deformity that uh, we may need to correct is muscle contractures. And you see that there are a number of techniques which have been uh, uh, designed uh, for releasing muscle contracture. We, we probably know all of them. Of course, uh, uh, tenotomy uh, is an easy uh, going solution. Uh, it's performed mostly for the FCU, pronator terrestre and biceps. Think twice before you cut a muscle, make sure that you could not be uh, uh, needing it uh, for a tendon transfer. So just, just think twice. Uh, rather than a simple tenotomy, we like to perform tenectomy to make sure that there is no uh, scar uh, forming in, in between the two ends. For Excuse me, for the wrist flexors now, uh, there is a quite a popular uh, medial epicondylar release. Uh, one must be a little bit careful uh, about the environment, uh, the uh, um, environing, I'm sorry, uh, nerves, not only the ulnar, this is obvious, but also the median nerve, which is not uh, so far away. Uh, this is um, um, an, an operation which has been said uh, to uh, induce some loss uh, of strength of flexion because when you let the muscles go uh, down distally, uh, you do not control how much a slide uh, um, takes place and, and you might uh, get uh, some, some quite important loss of flexion unless you decide to attach uh, the muscles uh, to uh, the skeleton, which could be uh, one solution. Uh, Zancoli has designed a very nice uh, equivalent uh, of, uh, of medial epicondylar release that he uses mostly in children. And instead of detaching the muscles from the bone, uh, what he does is uh, doing an aponeurectomy of uh, uh, all the envelopes of uh, the medial epicondylar muscles. This does not amount to as much release as uh, the former operation. And so uh, we, we uh, in our team reserve it to mostly to children with moderate uh, contracture of the wrist flexors. And uh, if there is contracture of wrist and finger flexors, well, then there is a big, uh, 
uh, Scaglietti page operations, a big uh, forearm slide named after Scaglietti, uh, Italian surgeon and Page, a British surgeon. And, uh, or maybe I'm wrong and somebody will tell me he was uh, American. Somebody will have to help me on that. Uh, and, and so you see this huge operation starting at the elbow and going all the way down the forearm and detaching everything from the skeleton. Uh, this is a big operation. It does give uh, satisfactory uh, results. This is a head injury, 20 year old female, and she had uh, both wrist and finger flexor contracture. And you see the excellent result at six months post-op. However, uh, this, as we say, is a wide dissection. There is a hematoma. The anterior uh, interosseous artery is at great risk. And uh, there is also through this technique, muscle weakening. I must say that I myself ha have uh, um, uh, pretty much abandoned uh, this, uh, this technique for spastic cases. And every time this is possible, I prefer uh, to turn to uh, uh, tendon and or muscle lengthening. So the lengthening towards the distal end of the muscle can be performed inside the tendon, intratendinous Z-plasty. Um, the problem with this uh, is that uh, this requires sutures and probably post-op immobilization for uh, the, the scar, uh, scarring and uh, union to, 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 um, to take place. Uh, and we prefer, every time it's possible, to use uh, lengthening at the tendal, tendon muscle junction. However, uh, some muscles with a very short overlapping of the tendon and the muscle uh, cannot be treated this way. And we do need uh, for, the bustle, for the biceps and the FCR, namely, uh, we do need to do uh, mostly intratendinous release. For uh, most of other uh, forearm, forearm and hand um, uh, flexor muscles, we can use this fractional lengthening. And, and you see on these pictures that we are able to do many fractional lengthening. If you look at the old textbooks, they would do one or maybe two, but uh, you, you can do more than that. You can do more than that, provided that you know how much overlapping there is of the muscle and the tendon. And uh, we, we did uh, last year, and this is also should be published uh, uh, pretty soon, a cadaver study for each of the forearm flexors. And we determine what we call the useful zone, the red arrow that you can see here uh, for each of these muscles. And uh, indeed, this useful zone can be very different. For example, for the FCU and the FCR that you see here, I just mentioned that the FCR, this is quite impossible to use this technique. And it comes out from this work that some of the muscles, namely FCU, all FDPs, FPL, and FDS of the third finger can be lengthened this way. All of the muscles, you need to watch to look at the muscle before uh, doing lengthening because this all, all overlapping zone is short. Recently, we have done more and more uh, combined procedure of uh, spasticity and contracture. As time is running, I will not uh, go into this and uh, we should be uh, publishing uh, uh, this also, uh, hopefully, uh, pretty soon. But you see this patient, he's a CP patient. He has both important spasticity and important contracture. So we did a hyperselective neurectomy at the same time as lengthening of his elbow flexors. And this is his spontaneous posture to the left. And uh, this is the great improvement to the right. So. Uh, just to tell you that uh, we don't have to choose in between all these procedures, we can add them if spasticity and contractures are, are, and contracture are both present. Another um, means of lengthening the uh, finger flexors has been designed by an American surgeon named Braun, and uh, this has been referred to as the STP procedure, superficialis to profundus, and this consists in a distal section of the superficialis muscles, proximal section of the profundi, and we just suture those two ends together. 
So which amounts to a very nice lengthening of the muscles with some continuity. Of course, this type of surgery with a, will amount to a limited active flexion, and uh, we reserve it mostly for non-functional or poorly functioning hands. In some cases, um, the uh, uh, wrist, and it's mostly the wrist, uh, can be extremely uh, contracted with uh, severe deformity. Soft tissue, tissue procedures in this type of deformities are not enough, and we need to resort to uh, wrist uh, arthrodesis. Uh, in adults, uh, this uh, is done in the form of a complete arthrodesis. We usually do a resection of the first copper row and the fusion of the radius to the second row, which gives a, a, a little uh, lengthening uh, of, uh, of the whole thing at the same time. Uh, rather than those big plates that you just saw here, we like to use nowadays smaller plates which are much uh, easier to apply to those uh, very uh, unusual, let's say, uh, wrists. And so uh, this is uh, what we perform, resection of the proximal row, as I said, and fusion of the radius to the distal row. That requires in most occasions also uh, some lengthening of the finger flexors, because when you bring the wrist back into a straight position, your finger flexors are going to be much tighter. So you need to take uh, uh, care of that and uh, do uh, those lengthening at the same time. In uh, small children, there may be a need in a few cases uh, to do a bone procedure when they have uh, extremely severely uh, flex wrist. Uh, rather than doing a complete uh, a fusion, we have been happy with mediocarpal arthrodesis, which leave uh, the radiocarpal joint and the growing plate intact. And that's quite nice, and it helps uh, holding them in, uh, in a pretty nice position. Uh, third and last, lastly, uh, the uh, voluntary control. So if there is paralysis, and if we want to reach some function, then uh, we need to bring back some voluntary control to this paralyzed antagonist. And of course, this is done for mainly uh, with tendon transfers, but how can we do tendon transfers? Uh, once we have explained that muscles are either spastic or, uh, or paralyzed, well, we can transfer spastic muscles. And this is, has been shown very nicely by Hoffer, uh, from Los Angeles many years ago. Uh, you can transfer spastic muscles, provided, of course, it has a voluntary control and it is strong, but also that it has the ability to relax. This is what we call a phasic muscle, and this is where uh, dynamic EMG studies are very helpful. And you see here on this graph, the FCU on the bottom line is phasic. It has the capacity of relaxing. Otherwise, this is what happens. This is a, a, a young girl I operated many, many years ago when I did not understand this. So I transferred a spastic FCU and, and made it into a spastic wrist extensor. And of course, she was not uh, better off with this, uh, uh, with this muscle that was not phasic. So the choice of donor will, of course, depend on your clinical examination and the EMG studies. It can be uh, mostly for wrist extensor and FCU, finger superficialis, et cetera, but it all can also be a brachioradialis and so forth. So it is the best mu muscle that we will uh, choose. Just uh, a word about, uh, about uh, tendon transfers in uh, children. This has been shown many years ago that uh, when doing tendon transfers for wrist extension, and, and here the choice was the FCU to the ECRB, the best results were in patients who were between seven and 12 years ago. So if you want to do tendon transfer in children, do them early. This is a result of such an operation at three months post-op. And you see that uh, the transfer here, this was a brachioradialis muscle. So transfer is quite nicely uh, active and performing. So we will uh, be doing a lot of combined procedures. 
we try to perform them all together whenever pos possible. But if we have to deal with several areas, several joints from the shoulder all the way to the fingers, uh, if we have to make a, cho a choice, we will usually start with the most severely deformed joint uh, and uh, also with the elbow before wrist and hand. We will go from uh, proximal to distal. And I like to end up with a thumb, which, uh, which position will be adapted best when we know how the wrist and the fingers are uh, dealing. I will end up very briefly with a few examples to show you all the different types of patients that we have uh, to deal with. And um, this is a bed wound, uh, bed bound, I'm sorry, patient with uh, severely severe cognitive problems. Uh, he's 62 uh, years old, no communication and terrible contractures of both shoulder, elbow, wrist and fingers. Uh, he's at home with his aging wife and uh, nursing is difficult. He, uh, he cries every time one moves uh, his joints. And so our goal here is only pain, nursing and hygiene. So what we're gonna do here is a lot of tenotomies at the level of the shoulder, at the level of the elbow, and at the level of the wrist and fingers here, here for the fingers, we did the STP procedure and you see before and at the end of surgery, we try to deal with both arms at the same time in these patients. And uh, this is uh, not very, should I say, rewarding surgery, but it's extremely helpful for the patient, the family and the caregivers. Uh, on the opposite, this is another stroke patient. He is 62 years old, and he has this strange spasticity in extension of the elbow, which is uh, unusual. And, and you can imagine how difficult uh, helping the patient to get uh, dressed and all the nursing are, 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 are uneasy and difficult with the elbow permanently in this extended position. And the clinical examination showed that indeed uh, spasticity was isolated, there was no contracture. So we decided in this particular case to perform hyperselective neurectomy of the motor branches of both triceps muscles. And uh, although our goal was only nursing, uh, I'm sorry, I did something wrong. Uh, so sorry. Well, you're gonna to have to believe me on that. Uh, he regained some very nice active uh, flexion of, uh, of the, oh, here it goes, of the elbow. Something is not working well here, I'm sorry. Uh, and next thing he asked was some improvement of the hand because now with a functioning elbow, he could, uh, he could uh, uh, hope for some function in the hand. And last case, is a 12 year old cerebral palsy child. He has a usual spontaneous posture in pronation with flexion, some adduction. Here we obviously have a functional goal. So we did a number of procedures at the same time. There was spasticity of the pronator terrestre. The choice there was a tenotomy. He had spasticity and contracture of the wrist flexors with paralysis of the extensors we did lengthening of the flexors and the transfer of the brachial radialis to the wrist extensors. And for the thumb, we did an opening of the first wave. So here he is, and uh, we're gonna see at his result at nine months. And uh, this is the uh, left uh, hemiplegia in uh, 12 years old, now he's 13 in a 12 years old uh, boy. And you see nine, year, nine months after surgery, this is pre-operative and you see this grasp, which is really rudimentary, not very precise. And that's him after surgery. So you see the change in the wrist position, the fingers opening and the thumb position. What you see also in uh, these uh, pictures, this is pre-op, 
what you see also in, uh, in, in these movies is that he is extremely concentrated on what he is doing. You can tell nine months after surgery, this is not yet very automatic. And again, that's why another uh, argument for uh, offering this type of surgery to children uh, quite early. We're gonna, we're gonna close this. Uh, and so as a conclusion, uh, we talked about clinical evaluation already. Uh, there is no such thing as a standard procedure in this surgery. We want to try and restore the balance. Uh, in children, we try to operate early. And I must say that this surgery is, uh, is, is not uh, a very easy surgery, not for the techniques, but mostly for the decision making. For those who, has, who are interested, Donald mentioned the uh, masterclass that we do yearly. Uh, this happens next October 23rd in Budapest. So it involves both, both lectures and mostly cadaver dissections. And we're gonna be doing all the procedures that uh, we've been talking about today. And the next and third uh, symposium on, on surgery of the spastic upper limb after the one in Paris and the second one in Venice will take place in Amsterdam. And it's uh, our friends from Amsterdam who are going to run it in April of next year. And thank you very much for uh, being uh, with me tonight. <laughs>